well, we'll shoot. We're going to talk about instrumentation, how the machine applies the physics to give us pictures, right? So with x-ray, we're talking about a two-dimensional image, right? So if we can imagine this is a weird-looking bone, right? We have a, a 2D image, right, of that bone. Um, so if, if there's something else like that thing there or this thing here, I can't tell if those are in front or behind or at the same level as, as that of that bone because I've only got these two dimensions, right? I have an, like a Y and an X coordinate, right? So when we move into CT scanning, the big question is how do we make like a 3D image, right? So I'm going to draw a really terrible axial image of someone's head, right? So there's their nose. Here's their brain, right? Oh, my goodness. This is like styluses make us all draw like five-year-olds, right? Yeah. Um, so, and the way that we're doing this is we've got like a, a receptor bank over here, and then we've got a tube right here, and it's creating x-rays and emitting and sending them through the patient. But then in addition to that, it's spinning around them, right? Um, so it's spinning around them as it does that. So if we can imagine, um, now what we're talking about is this X, Y, and a Z axis, right? Um, the Z axis would be, for all intents and purposes, the axis that would be coming straight out of the, the whiteboard and smacking you in the forehead, right? Um, now, one of the things that we talked about earlier is since we have kind of a tube-shaped, you know, body, we're going to apply like a bow tie filter to that, right? So that as it's spinning around, um, it's, uh, it's accounting for kind of the cylindrical shape of people's bodies, right? So in terms of what's happening over here on the receptor side, we've got this thing full of millions and millions of voxels, right? And the way these voxels work is they're, they're like little image receptor banks, right? This is my little three-dimensional drawing of, of what a voxel is. Mm -hmm. So there's all these little receptors right in here. And whenever, um, whenever uh, an, an x-ray beam strikes one of those voxels, it records um, a number related to attenuation, right? And so like what we were talking about earlier, if we've got a bone, right? We've got a bone, and it's made of millions and millions and millions and millions of voxels, right? And then, so it's going to have like a high number. So this would be a bone. And then let's say that we've also got... <laughs> let's say that above that we've got a muscle, and it's going to be full of millions and millions and millions of voxels. And then also we might have like a layer of fat. And again, it's going to... The machine is going to tie it to millions and millions and millions of voxels, right? So this fat is going to have like... A low, what does this little Greek thing mean? Attenuation, attenuation coefficient. Yeah, the, the the Greek letter is mu, right? This thing yes. looks kind of like a melting M, right? Like mu. Um, <laughs> I'm glad someone laughed at that. Um, and then this muscle might have like a medium mu linear attenuation coefficient, right? And then bone's going to have that high, high mu. <laughs> All right. Um, so in terms of what these voxels are telling us, right, if I can divide them up into like this, we would call this a matrix of voxels, right? Um, so they're going to record different attenuation values and represent them spatially, right? So now we kind of know these are different areas that have been tagged to different areas within the patient's body, right? And so we're going to put that on a scale, and we're just, uh, we're just talking about linear attenuation co coefficient kind of stuff, but we're going to put that on like a scale. For our own purposes, let's just think about from 1 to 8. So low would be, 1 would be like a low attenuation, like the fat, right? And eight would be a high one like, like the bone, okay? So now kind of getting that kind of basic stuff out of the way, let's look at how the CT scanner is kind of thinking about that. So let me see if I can, how do I erase all of this information and start over? 
Do I add? No. I apologize. On my ad, it said new picture. Did it say new picture? Uh -huh. Can I just, is there a way I can just add like a new, I was thinking oh, I could oh. just progress, but. I tried that. Oh, no. um, <laughs> extra credit. Okay. All right. <laughs> So let's say again we've got we've got that patient's body, right? And let's say that we don't know what these numbers are, right? We don't know what these numbers are inside of this. This is the way my son draws a window. But this is a matrix, right? Yeah, I'm sorry if my little robot lady's in the way. Um, so what we're gonna do, what we're saying we're gonna do in CT is we're going we're gonna to pass x-rays through it in this way. And again, we're, we're pretending like we do not know these values, right? And we're going to record those over here, right? So if we pass x-rays that way, we're going to add these little numbers up. We get 7 and we get 9. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we're going to move it like 45 degrees, and we're going to pass x-rays at it from this direction, right? And if we do that over here at our image receptor, we're going to get like, what, like a 4, an 11, and a 1. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, then we're going to move another 45 degrees and pass x-rays through in this direction. And so 4 plus 8 is going to give us 12, right? And 3 plus 1 is going to give us 4, okay? And then finally, we're going to pass x-rays from one last angle. And over here... We're going to get like a 3, a 5, and an 8, okay? Um, so now we're starting to think about how we have, now we have the linear attenuation coefficients. We have the physics, right? We have, we've tied this to a geometry, right? We're moving the x-ray tube and then taking an image, right? Now we need to think about how the instrumentation of the CT scanner gives us a workable image from that. Because I cannot, I cannot look at this and tell you anything other than 3, 4, 1, and 8, right? And I don't know binary, so I don't know what the com how the computer's looking at it. But I have to figure out a way to make this understandable to a human being, right? So the process that the computer goes through with this information we call reconstruction, right? Um, not like the Civil War reconstruction that my wife bemoaned me talking about <clears throat> on Valentine's Day. Um, so, what we're talking about here is, I'm just going to take these numbers and I'm just going to put them in this matrix here, right? Seven, seven, it's such a, it, it's a terrible holiday. Um, so, I've just transposed those, that, those numbers into this first matrix, right? And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get fancy because that's what computers do best. They take, they take boring stuff like this and make it fancy, right? So we're going to pass the numbers that we got from up there through it, right? So we're talking about like the, the 1, the 11, and the, uh, right, 1, 11, and 4. I'm running out of space here, but bear with me. Can, can you kind of understand that? So... <clears throat> I'm going to draw a new matrix. So 4 plus 7 is going to give me 11, right? Um, let me see. 11 plus 7 is going to give me an 18, right? 11 plus um, 9 now is going to give me a 20, right? And then 1 plus 9 right here is going to give me a 10. Does that make sense? what I just did. Did I lose anyone on that step? Mm -hmm. I lost people. Okay. Yeah. Um, let me let me try to draw this a little bit better. Bear with me. I'm going to erase this and <clears throat> try to draw because um, this is this is the one downside of trying to whiteboard like this is um, it, this is a weird space to be working with for me. Okay. Um, so I'm going to draw this matrix a little bit bigger. So the first matrix I made was seven, seven, nine, nine, right? And now, um, let me get rid of this too. I'm surprised you put where did that come from again? <laughs> it just right took from. Off, off the other matrix. Yeah, it, 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 I took these numbers right here, okay. and then just made them into a matrix. Okay. Right. 
Now I'm going to take these numbers right here, right? And I'm going to pass them through the matrix in the direction that they were acquired at, right? So this is going to be a 4. This is going to be an 11. And this is going to be a 1 that I pass through in these directions, right? So this is what we this is what we're talking about. We're talking about algorithm, really specific steps, almost like a recipe that the computer has to go through to get us the information we need, right? So that's going to give me this matrix down here, where I say four plus seven equals eleven, right? Eleven plus seven equals eighteen. Eleven plus nine equals twenty, right? And then 1 plus 9 equals 10. Did that make sense that time? Mm -hmm. This is all the little steps that this computer is going through to construct an axial image, right? Um, we're not even going to try to talk about helical imaging because yeah. it's volumetric and stuff, oh, stuff goes crazy. Um, so now I've got these values here, this 4 and this 12 right? I'm going to pass them through in the direction that they were acquired, right? So <clears throat> I'm, going to, I'm going to move my matrix over here for this part, right? So 12 plus 11 is going to give me 23, right? 12 plus 11. 12 plus 20 is going to give me 20, oh, 32, right? Mm -hmm. Now 4 plus 18 is going to give me 22, and then 4 plus 10 is going to give me 14. Everyone track with me there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I, I have one last uh, direction I need to pass information through. It's like this direction here, right? So, from that direction, I got like a 3, a 5, and an 8, right? Mm -hmm. So, I'll draw one final matrix, right? And 8 plus 32 is going to give me 40. What do I want to do next? 5 plus 23. Yep, so that's 28. And then what else? 5 plus 14. Yep, is 19. Good, y'all are getting it. And then 22 and 3. Yep, it's going to give me 25 right up here. Okay, so now I have like all of, I've, I've constructed my data set, right? Now this is where... Um, the four-year kind of stuff starts to come into line because now that I have all of this data constructed, I need to kind of degrade the data a little bit because I'm trying to get back to this. So I'm going to try to subtract out things, right? And so the computer is going to apply these kind of subtractionary kind of things. So let me progress. To but one of the things that's very important about this <clears throat> is that we're talking about Oh my goodness, now what is it doing? All right, bear with me. Oh, please. 19 and 40. The very first thing that we're going to do is um, we're going to, if y'all remember, my initial, the initial acquisition that I got had to do with a, a 7 and a 9. Do y'all remember that? I had a little matrix that was like a 7 and a 9. I'm just going to add 7 plus 9 equals what 16 I'm going to subtract 16 from everything in this whole grid right it's going to wholesale subtract 16 from everything because I'm 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 now decaying or I'm subtracting out um, these different acquisition values so 16 minus 25 is going to give me 9 16 minus 28 is going to give me 12 16 minus 19 is going to give me 3 and then 16 minus 40 is going to give me 24, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this had to do with that very first direction that I acquired information from, right? Um, but I acquired information from three other directions, right? There were three other directions that I acquired info from. Um, so now I'm just going to divide all of these numbers by three. And when I do that... Um, that final step in the algorithm, right? I'm going to get 3, 4, 1, and 8. Okay? That's how the computer, that's all of the little steps that the computer does to figure out what 
what uh, what linear attenuation coefficients, what numbers to apply to the information that it received as it spun around the patient, okay? Um, now, one of the things that's, that's important about this, if we go, okay, all right, I, I apologize. I'm still getting the grip of this stuff. Um, if we go back to talking about this two-dimensional image, right, we only had to acquire information from one direction, right? If I'm talking about making this three-dimensional image, right, I've had to apply radiation from all these different directions to get this image. So we're talking about a significant increase in dose, right? That's kind of the that's the that's kind of one of the important things coming out of this is that we've significantly increased patient dose, right? So if a chest X-ray is something like like two Rankin, right, or whatever it is, I don't know what is it, millirankin. Um, so like a there and back, like a round trip ticket to Paris, right? The chest CT might be two hundred millirankin, right? Like 200, you know, trips to Paris, okay? And that's why we've significantly increased the doses because we're acquiring this stuff from so many different directions, okay? Um, okay, questions about that? All right, well, thinking about that, let's talk real quickly about collimation and pitch, all right? And this will be kind of the last thing that we'll talk about today. Um, so... Um, our book does some really good jobs talking about collimation and pitch. Um, the parts that we're going to be kind of focusing on, I, and I think it, they're important to y'all's, um, in, important to the quiz for next week, is um, like maybe page like 51 through page... 55 in the book. Um, those will be the parts that I'll kind of focus on when we're talking about pitch and, uh, and collimation. So one of the first things that, um, that we should talk about real quickly is looking at page 52, we have an effective slice thickness, right? Um, And this, this kind of relates to um, beam divergence a little bit. Um, so, but what it's saying is that... <clears throat> the slice kind of blooms as, um, as it's acquired, right? No, I did not draw that well. Um... <coughs> So if, if we told it we want it to have a slice like this, our effective slice thickness might be like that, right? Um, and this relates to both divergence and how these detector arrays work, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about how collimation works and how, um, how pitch works and stuff like that. So, um, so... At max, a, a like a multi-detector CT scanner, um, it can be collimated to the entire multi-row detector array, right? What that means is if I have a detector array like this, the widest I can make this collimation is to the size of that detector array, right? So if this is my tube making x-rays, I can't open up my collimator any bigger than that. And that's, um, that's kind of like the maximum, um, what we would call beam, uh, I'm sorry, uh, beam collimation, right? Now, in addition to that, um, something that can be a little bit difficult to wrap your head around, it took me a long time to think about, um, but in thinking about those linear attenuation coefficients, we also need to talk about detector collimation, right? So... Each one of these voxels inside my detector array is performing its own little collimation thing because it's at some point cutting off the data that it's receiving and it's saying, I got an 8, 
right? It's not, I didn't get this 2 down here, right? Um, and I didn't get 11. I didn't get like a combination of 8 and 11. So effectively what's happening is these little detectors are collimating in their own little small world in their own way, right? To say that they got an 8 or a 2 or a 3 or whatever, right? And that goes back to this effective, this effective size, right? Um, just kind of let that marinate in the back of your head. But that's what we're talking about when we, talked about when we talk about detector collimation, okay? Now, the reason this is important is because a lot of times in CT scan, we talk about different kinds of slice systems, right? Like a, this is a 64 slice scan. Like I went to this one uh, clinical place and they kept on calling it a slicer. They are like, this is a 64 slicer. And I was just like, yeah, I, I don't know where you learn, but I've always just called it a 64 slice machine. So, um, but 64 slicer. Um, so, yeah, right? 64 slicer means that it's going to have 64... Yeah, well, actually, it's going to have like a width. It's going to have like a bank of 64, right? Um, so that for every scan, every movement of the tube around the patient, right? it's going to be able to acquire a, a depth of 64 voxels, right? Um, so it's like if you can imagine this, right, being 64. Um, I thought it was like that was the maximum mass, like slices. It is. It is. It's, it's like, it's like, okay, let's, let's, let's draw it with the patient present so that this kind of gels with everybody. So I've got the patient right here, right? Um, it's a really sad looking person here. Um, what I'm saying is this 64 slicer, if we can imagine a bank of detectors that has an array like this deep on it, right? So that every time it goes around the patient, it's able to acquire 64 images, right? So when I'm drawing this detector, this collimator, and this this it looks like they're being abducted by aliens now. Um, but uh, like they're laying on a bed of nails and being abducted by aliens. Um, this is my life in Utah, people. I'm not happy. Um, so what I'm saying though is the width of it, right? Is the width of this detector array along the z-axis. That's an important point. So I'm glad that Morgan brought it up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, if we're thinking about all that junk, and we've got this 64 slicer, right? Um, the way that we can kind of calculate the, the kind of maximum dimension here, right? So this is, we're saying this is 64 little voxels or whatever here, right? If I want to know what the distance is here, then I need to know, um, this a detector size, right? So all this stuff is kind of interrelated, I guess is what I'm getting at. But um, this detector collimation, right, is going to equal, um, we're going to say uh, D, the big D means beam collimation, right? Um, so the amount the beam was collimated right here um, over like the number of detector rows, so 64 in this case, right? So let's, one more time. So <clears throat> D is going to be detector collimation. Big D is going to equal the beam collimation. And then N is going to equal that number, the slicer, right? Number of detectors. So the number of images it can detect every time it goes around a detector, around the patient. D is what detector? Little d is, 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 uh, is detector collimation. <coughs> so we're talking about... <clears throat> Just to draw this out, maybe um, one more time for you. So D is going to be the amount that the tube is kind of collimating the beam, right? Then little d 
is going to be that amount over here, right, the detector collimation. And then that's going to be related by this n number, right, the number of um, little detector cells, right? So what was it, like little d equals big d, big d divided by n? Yeah, and the formula again is d, and it's typically going to be in millimeters, okay, equals big D, also in millimeters, over N, just expressed as slicer, right? <laughs> so, for example, a lot of machines have a um, detector collimation of 0 0.625, right? Mm -hmm. So each one of these little dudes here equals six, uh, 0.625. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we're going to say that that's equal to <clears throat> a beam collimation, so the area that this beam has been told it can scan of 40 millimeters, right? And that's going to be over 64. Okay. So it's all interrelated by that, by that basic formula. Okay? I'm not going to ask y'all to do this formula. Thank you. Um, but I want y'all to know what this is talking about. How the, um, the detector collimation, these little areas here, is tied to the area that this thing is producing x-rays over and how that is tied to the number of detectors that we have in that array. Okay, because this goes back to that acquisition geometry stuff. Questions about that? Okay, so this here is that this directly affects the volume of tissue measured, right? So for every rotation of, um, of the scanner, we're saying that collimation affects the volume of the tissue that we can measure linear attenuation coefficients in, okay? So another way that we can kind of think about this is um, what we call section width and section interval. And this will be kind of the last thing that we'll talk about today. Um, this is in our book, uh, kind of beginning on um, page 54. It has to do with pitch, basically. So what we're going to talk about real quickly is pitch and how that relates to section width and section interval. Um, thanks, dude. Yeah, awesome. Do you have that uh, recorder device? <laughs> no, I'll take the snooker bar, too. <laughs> 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 All right. Yeah, no, they are good. Um, so, looking at, looking at our, um, at our book, um, Typically, when we're talking about pitch, we're talking about detector pitch. Um, I don't want us to really get lost. Let me see. Let me... Oh, wait, I, I take that back. Typically, what we're talking about when we talk about pitch is we want to talk about beam pitch. I'm sorry about that. Um, these terms, they they developed kind of after um, after I studied for the board, so I've kind of had to revise the way I think about this stuff. So let's just focus on beam pitch for our purposes today, okay? So pitch can also be called, she mentions that pitch can also be called um, beam pitch. I'll try to make this as simple as possible. Um, I've got a note in here that's confusing me. Bear with me for just a sec. Um, yeah, right. Okay, beam pitch. Um, so, in this instance, pitch is going to be tied to um, the amount that the table moves um, per each rotation, right? Um, so, one way that we can talk about beam pitch is 
beam pitch equals the table feed. So the table feed like along the z-axis divided by right the total collimation. And what we're talking about here when we talk about total collimation is um, that area D, big D, right? Um, so if I were to draw this kind of a representation of this, I'm talking about the amount that this table can move along the Z axis, right? compared to the amount here that I can sample, right? So big D. As it's spinning around, right? Um, so, kind of significant to that, we can talk about section width. So this is going to be um, the sl slice thickness, right? This is a lot of times text just talk about slice thickness. Um, kind of a general term, another general term for it would be section width. So this is going to describe the amount of tissue along the z-axis displayed in the image, right? So um, <clears throat> this is now asking us to imagine an image we can make a preset, we can, we can tell the computer, I want to see images that are five millimeters thick, right? That's the, the five millimeter section width, right? So that means if, if, if this is the patient, right? Every five millimeters, I'm going to be seeing a slice, right? That's section width. Um, Section interval, right? So the other way that pitch can be thought about is in terms of section interval. And this, the way to think about section interval is the spacing between those slices. Spacing between slices. So if I have a pitch of one, it means that for every five millimeter slice that I get, the table's going to move five millimeters, right? Um, if, <clears throat> if I've got this array of detectors, right, like a 40 millimeter array of detectors, and I tell it, I want you to um, give me a pitch of one, over that 40 millimeter array of detectors, then for every 40 millimeter acquisition, it's going to move the table 40 millimeters, right? That's all we're talking about here, is how much the table moves versus the size of the area that we can get information for. Does the table speed change? Yes. Um, yes, it does. It can. Um, yeah, depending on the pitch that we've asked it to acquire information at. Okay? That was especially true with some of the older generation scanners, but it still has some effects today. Okay? So, this is kind of um, where all this becomes important. So, if the section width, right... equals uh, five millimeters, right? <clears throat> but the pitch equals 1.5. And our book does a good job of pointing out <clears throat> on page 54 that the most common range for pitches is 1 to 1.5. So this is it's pretty much a maximum pitch, right? Um, what we're talking about is the table has to move How far? It's going to be 5 times 1.5, so 7.5 millimeters, right? 7.5 millimeters for every acquisition, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason this is helpful is twofold, right?
world in which the fastest growing area of data is medicine, right? So if I send, a, if, if I am doing just a stone study, and I send my, and I decide that I'm going to do a, a pitch of one and acquire um, like 0.6 millimeter slices, and I send that over to the doctor, we're going to be talking about like hundreds of thousands of images maybe, right? And I'm just going to bog down the system. It's useless information. It's like I don't... No stone that we could detect is going to be that small, right? Um, the other thing about it is we're talking about frying the patient, right? The more I drop that pitch, the bigger a dose the patient's going to be getting, right? Um, so we have to find kind of a happy medium here from this 1 to 1.5 pitch range. But the, one of the things that we kind of have to, that has to inform that decision goes back to that linear attenuation stuff that we were talking about at the very beginning, right? And how it's averaging those numbers. Um, like, for instance, say we've got a tumor in this patient's body that looks like that, right? Um, but we've got a pitch that's skipping a beat. It's skipping 2.5 millimeters every slice that it acquires, right? So we've got a slice... Um, right here that's that thick, then it's skipping this part here, and then a slice that's that thick, and then it's skipping this part here, and then a slice that's that thick, but it's skipping this part here, right? Um, now, when it averages what these different linear attenuation coefficients are, right, um, it's missing a portion of the data, right? It's saying that this is a 1. So we've lost some information in the way that it's averaged that stuff together, okay? So these different slices, these slice width, right, and section interval, so this would be my slice width here, and this would be my section interval, the amount that it moved between slices, right? Um, our, our, we have kind of different ways that we can talk about them. So... Um, we can talk about contiguous slice intervals, right? And this would be a slice interval like this. Like every slice goes right up next to the next slice, right? So this would be contiguous, right? Then we can talk about non-contiguous, which anytime we're working with a pitch over one, right, we're going to be dealing with non-contiguous slices. We have a volume of data, but the slices are not contiguous. So that's going to look... Like here's a slice, and then there's an interval, and then there's a slice, and then there's an interval, and then there's a slice, and then there's an interval. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to call this non-contiguous. So this contiguous stuff is pitch of 1. Pitch equals 1. Non-contiguous is going to be a pitch, any pitch... Greater than one, right? Greater than the Pac-Man wants to eat the thing greater than the one, right? <laughs> All right. The last kind of thing is if we drop the pitch below one, because we can turn the pitch down to less than one, and now what we're going to get is overlapping slices, right? We're going to have slices that overlap like this. You all kind of see how I'm drawing that? There's going to be some overlap regions right here, right here, right here. And so we're going to call this overlap. Overlap, if I can spell. And so that's going to be anything with a pitch less than 1. Okay, so pitch equals a number less than 1. Pac-Man wants to get the 1 and not the pitch, right? This is important if we're... The reason that this is important is anytime we're doing a 3D study, some of our verification simulations, our, our, our virtual simulations, we may actually want to pitch with some overlap because they can then take that information and reconstruct it and have a unified, they can make sure that all that volume unifies, right? So if I'm needing to do 3D rotations of the anatomy, Right? If I'm needing to make any kind of volumetric determination, like what, what they're doing in dosimetry for radiation therapy, I may be asked to have a pitch of less than one, right? So that there is that overlap of information, and as the computer's averaging out these different linear attenuation coefficients, it's giving me a, 
a better than one to one ratio. Like it's giving me a very accurate reading. Okay. So that's pretty much it for today. Questions about any of that? Okay, y'all have been really awesome.